Uh, so just a recap on last week. I thought last week's um, sermon it was short, but it was good. And um, we spoke about, uh, you know, the, the last three weeks, or today as well, we're going to speak about transformation and the importance to transform, to change. How many of you guys know God wants you to change? God wants you to change. God loves you for sure. There's nothing that you can do that'll make God love you more. There's nothing that you can do that'll make God love you less. He loves you, that's it. But uh, God wants you to change. God has got, had an idea. And uh, the more you get to know Him, the more you understand His plan and His purpose for you. So, He loves you. You know, that's it. He loves you. And you're accepted and you're, you're loved by Him. But uh, um, he, he is bringing us to change. He is bringing us to transformation. I think the, one of the most saddest places that you can find yourself in Christianity is complacency. Is when you're just, just hanging around, just lukewarm. Um, and so we know the scriptures, you know, either be cold or be hot. <laughs> But don't be lukewarm. Don't be in the middle. And, and God, was, uh, God was speaking to us about getting off the fence. You know, you have to get off the fence. Jump into what God has planned for you. Amen? Get off the fence. And, and I want to encourage uh, everyone that's here today, you know, get off the fence. <laughs> jump in. You know, jump in. Go for what God has planned and purposed for your life. Go for it. So, and then um, we spoke, I thought this was a good point. Have you guys know Christianity is not about getting a good retirement plan? It's not about fire insurance. It's about, it's about what God wants to do now. So John 14, about Jesus said, I am the tr- way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus never came to introduce the retirement plan. He came to introduce family, the opportunity of being family. So you, having God, your Father. Every religion is going to try and take you to God. Christ takes you to the Father, and then you can call Him Father. So it's it's not about you know. I've always asked, I mean, why would God? God doesn't need people in heaven. God, there's a lot of people in heaven. God's not looking for people to occupy houses in heaven. God wants children. God wants family. And that's why Jesus said, no one comes to the Father through me. You have to come through Christ. And when you come through Christ, you get a father. Amen? You get family. Is that right? And I think, I think that's awesome. So God always, he, uh, the offer is... Is, is family. And that we get the opportunity to call God our Father. But when we do that, what does it say about us? You know, have you ever acknowledged what it's saying about you when you call Him Father? Father. What you're actually declaring over your own self. What you're actually declaring over your life. You know, um, you, a cat, the, when, it, when it's a cat and it has kittens, doesn't give birth to a different kind of animal. It's also cats. So when God is your father, I mean, you, you have royalty. You're, you're, you're divine. You know, that's what Peter says. He says, you can be partakers of the divine nature. Wow. So we, we become divine. But anyway, so we're going we're gonna to carry on from there. And I, I was thinking about what we can um, title today. I was just call it the image. Image. Everybody is, is, is on about image, particularly kids today, you know, with Facebook and Instagram. Everyone's taking photos of themselves and everyone wants a certain image. I mean, when we were growing up, we were just reading Bible and we never worried about what people thought about us, you know. I'm joking. No, everybody kind of, you know, we're concerned about our image. Um, I mean, guys, no, it's, it's not wrong to care what others think about you. For example, if, if you don't use deodorant and you don't care, you begin to smell. So it's not wrong to care about what others think about you. But it's wrong to be controlled by that. To be, to be 
to be bound, to be bound by the opinions of people. And in life, you're going to live to please other people or God. And, and Paul writes, and he says, hey, I'm going to live a life that's pleasing to God. And he says, if I seek, I think it's Galatians 1 verse 10. He says, if I was seeking the approval of men, I should not be a bond servant of Christ. Hectic, eh? Hey? You know, all the likes on Facebook today. You know, I've got a YouTube channel. One of them, I've gone through different phases in my life. Sometimes I watch, and I, one, I had long hair. Some people will, will go on the video just to comment about the long hair. <laughs> or about the tattoo. Or about whatever, not hearing anything about the message. Somebody else is sitting and listening and being blessed. You know? So, the thing is, if we're going to build our lives around the opinions of people. How many of you guys know that, that somebody else's opinion is a terrible place to put your happiness? <laughs> so we need to, we need to know who, who we're going to, you know, who we're going to please. And I think in our faith, um, it's really, really, really um, important. So going forward, think about this. My children, they, I love them. And I told, told this, said this earlier. There's nothing that they can do that will make me love them less. There is nothing that they can do that will make me love them more. But when, when they listen, when they are obedient, when they practice what we taught them, it's pleasing to me. It pleases me. And I think when it comes to our relationship with Christ, it's just approaching God like, it doesn't matter what I do, He loves me. You know, it's a terrible place to live. You know, if you want to live like that, live like that. I don't think that's what God has, has, has planned for us. He's got an ideal plan. And one that's pleasing to Him. And we sang it this morning. He says, Lord, take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you. I want to burn for you. And that's, that's to live a life that's pleasing for Him. That's to walk in to step into his plans and his purposes and to say, Lord, I'm going to go for it full out. And I'm going to avoid living for the praises of, of people. Um, that quote that says, if you, live, if you live for the praises of men, you're going to die by their criticism. <laughs> you know, just go on Facebook. I, and Facebook is these live videos of famous preachers, you know. I have a look of T.D. Jakes's people always commenting about his, his clothes for the day. They literally go online just to comment about what he's wearing. So, if you live for the praises of men, you will die by their criticism. Okay, so let's, let's start there. So I want to speak about image and how important image is. You know, how image, um, they say, I wrote it down here, that the humans have got three images. Okay. So, a projected image, a perceived image, and an actual image. Okay. A projected image is the way you desire others to see you. You know, the way you desire others to see you. A perceived image is how others really see you. <laughs> how do you guys know that the projected image and the perceived image is not really who you are? Because you have an actual image as well. And that's the one that God sees. And that's the one that maybe every now and then you realize, hey, this is who I am. So when I have a projected image, I'm trying to please someone. I want someone to see me like this way. It's not always a bad thing, like I said. It's not a bad thing to, to enjoy, to look good, to be healthy. It's good to do that. Dress up. If you can, you know, dress up, enjoy it. Um, but, but when it is playing not just with your image but your identity, then it just begins to become uh, deceitful. Then your perceived image is how others see you, and then you have um, you have your actual image. Okay. All right, so we're going we're gonna to start from there. 
And let's go, let's go to James 1. Okay, verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not just listeners to it, betraying yourselves. So sometimes, especially particularly the book of James, yeah, it's a hectic book. Just when you think you've you've now understood grace and you then you read the book of James and it's like what? It throws a whole other angle on it. And it's a very it's, it comes across very strict, very stern. But he says, be doers of the word. Not merely listeners. Be doers of the word and not just listeners. Betraying yourselves. And what this really means is what I've been explaining to you. Don't be on the fence. Don't just sit and listen and then you're living like you, you're in a different reality. We all experience it. Explained it last week. I, I went through different phases in my life and maybe some of you that sitting here could, can relate to it. My parents took us to a lot of different churches and uh, there was a particular phase in my life where I would go to church and feel guilty about everything I did in the week and then give my life to Jesus on that Sunday. Come Monday, I'm doing the same things that I was doing and then Sunday I'm giving my life to Jesus again. All right? Because our, when you realize you, you fail to meet certain rules and commandments and then when you do that it plays with your identity you think oh goodness i'm not saved you go again to church you give your life to jesus or your heart to jesus what's those those animals certain animals in the sea i think octopus and things like that have got four hearts maybe i was like that i gave this heart on sunday and the next heart on the next sunday but but we all had (laughs) i had that opportunity until i encountered the love of jesus the real love of the Father, and I knew I've saved and I've never looked back. I've never ever looked back. But he says, stick with me, uh, be doers of the word and not merely listeners to it. It's really, it's a hard thing when you, when you get an instruction that is lifeless, that is not, that your heart is not in, and to do something that your heart is not in. I don't know, does that make sense? When, when uh, love your neighbor, have you tried to love your neighbor? My soul, it is not the easiest thing to do. Some people, some people, are, yeah, some people are, might be a little bit easier to love. Other people are not easy to love. But when there's, when there's no spirit, when it's not inspired, um, you, you can't love your neighbor. You can't, <laughs> you can't love your neighbor. But when, 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 when the spirit is working on the inside of you, when you're full of God, when you're loving God, you'll find yourself loving your neighbor. There's certain things that just happen automatically when the motive and, the, and when your attention is on the right place. Uh, yeah, okay, it's going to get clearer as we go. Let's read on. Next verse. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it and being like a doer and being a doer of it, He's like a man who looks at his own natural face in a mirror. All right, so we're busy with image. For he, he thoughtfully observes himself and then he goes off and he forgets what he looks like. It's a strange analogy because a doer of the word, one who does the word and one who does not do the word, uh, is like a man who looks in a mirror, sees an image, and then he leaves and he forgets about the image. So what it's actually trying to say is, is you have to be mindful about that image that you saw. You have to see the image. When you're seeing the image, that's the powerful thing, is when you're not seeing the image, then you're not a doer of the word. I'm, I want to tell you, you can, I've said this before, but you can try to love. Love that is not inspired by God, you're missing it. I've heard it so many times. People come to me and correct me. Or you've heard it. Someone comes to you and says, don't do that. I'm just telling you this because I love you. And sometimes you can pick it up that it's not a genuine love. This is someone trying to feel special about themselves. Trying to, to meet the, 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 the commands of God saying, love your neighbor and say, okay, I love this guy. So I'm going to tell him about his long hair or tell him whatever it is. Correct him. And then they feel better about themselves. Okay. Lord, help us. It's going to get better. 
is let's let's read on and i'm gonna for he thoughtfully observed himself okay but he who looks carefully into the faultless law of liberty and is faithful to it and per perseveres in looking to it being not a heedless listener but a listener who forgets but an active doer so an active doer is someone who looks and looks and looks and perseveres in looking and this is what god wants from us is to keep looking is to keep looking into the word is to keep not reading the bible looking into the word it's a different thing is to it means living in the reality of a, of a relationship with jesus looking into his face constantly when i look into his face i doing the word when i when i take the word as an instruction and i and i try to fulfill it without that image i'm not going to be able to do it but the moment one turns to the lord with an open heart the veil is lifted you know we act these kind of things out in our marriages you know when you when you lift a veil and you look into your bride's eyes you know at that moment that's what he's saying and he says now the lord i'm referring to is the holy spirit and wherever he is the lord is there is freedom or there is liberty we can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces how many guys know that you're qualified right now you are qualified to access the presence of god he looks at you with no shame no there's no guilt there's no nothing that you have to feel he says he says, with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. He says, we are being transfigured into His very image. So, you have to change. Check yourself out. It's alright to monitor. Lord, am I changing? Am I, am I transforming? You know, it's, Paul speaks about the faith test in in Corinthians he says just test yourself and it's healthy to do it to check it out then the problem is is not you it's just where you're looking it's just the attention that you're giving it's just the, the people that you're trying to please and um, he says we are being transfigured into his image as we move from one brighter glory to another so this this translation says we become like mirrors now earlier on we said that we look into the word as in a mirror okay this same verse quickly read it in um, amplified for me just put it on but all of us with unveiled face continue to be holding the word of god as in a mirror so it's actually speaking about the word of god as a mirror the passion translation puts it also nice it says that we become mirrors who reflect you reflect the glory so here's what I what I found the Word of God is a mirror how many guys know that God thinks good stuff about you but the problem is some of us don't think that God thinks good stuff about us and I don't think we we really know how awesome the thoughts are that God has for us I mean, David writes about it in the Psalms. He says, how weighty, how precious are your thoughts. You knew me. You know every, you know every detail about me. The numbers on my head, you know everything, everything about me. Now, the problem is sometimes with actual image, perceived image, uh, what was the other one? Uh, projected image. With these images that we're trying to portray to others, is what we think others think about us or what we think God thinks about us it's it's illusions and not necessarily the truth about what he says and what he sees and so the way that he's actually saying is here's how I'm gonna give you your identity and he sent Christ and Christ walked amongst men and 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 the Bible says in 1 John, it says, and we saw his glory. Now that image is the image that we must look at. 
when I see that image of Christ, I see my identity. I see who I am in Christ. How many guys remember the, the story of, is it, um, what was Jacob's boss's name? Was it um, Laban? Thank you. And uh, he, he made a deal. Jacob made a deal with Laban with the goats. You guys remember the goats? And so what happened was he would take all the spotted ones. Am I right? And so what he did was in the waters, he put, he put little sticks in the waters where they, where, they, where they bred. And eventually it bore children with spots. Now this is the cool thing. So when those cows or goats, goats I think it was, saw the water, I think they saw the reflection. So they saw themselves and they saw the reflection of those sticks. You know, back in those days they didn't have mirrors. So they had to make use water. So water would be like a kind of a mirror. And when they saw that, they changed. There was a transformation that happened. And I think this is what God does. You know, this is what God does. He puts these things in the mirrors and He, he gives you your, your identity. We are sheep of His pasture. Amen. Come on. So He works with us like that. So um, I'm going to give a, another lesson. What's the right word? Geography. Astrology. Think about the moon, the sun, and the earth. Three, two shiny lights and one that needs light. Let's, and we're going to read this in John. Go to John 12. Lord, you are good. I hope that you're inspired. John 12, he says... You can make the notes. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. John 12, verse 23. He replied to them, Now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, this is all speaking about the cross of Christ. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies. Because then it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat. All because one grain died. Now this is Jesus speaking about himself. Likening himself to seed time and harvest. And saying that there will only be one. One seed. But if it dies, there will be many. How many guys know that you are part of the harvest? Of that seed that fell into the ground and died. He says, the person who loves his life pampers himself will miss true life. I'll say that again. The person who loves him, his life, pampers his, his life, will miss his true, true life. The one who detaches his life from the world and abandons himself to me will find true life and enjoy it forever. If you want to be my disciples, follow me and you will go where I'm going. And if you truly follow me as my disciple, my Father will show you, will shower His favor upon your life. Alright? Then the Bible speaks about this audible voice coming. And um, I want you to go to verse 34. People from the crowd spoke up and said, Die, how could the anointed one die? The Word of God says that the anointed one will live with us forever. But you just said that the Son of Man must be lifted up from the earth. Who is the Son of Man anyway? Jesus replied, You will have the light shining with you only for a little while longer. While you have me, walk in the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. For when you walk in the dark, you have no idea where you're going. So believe and cling to the light while I'm with you so that you will become children of the light. Wow. Become children of the light. You become children of the light. James 1 says that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. You are, a, you are children of the light. He is the Father of lights. But this is amazing. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Then moments later, 
he speaks to the crowds and he says, you are the light of the world. Now, let's get back to the moon and the sun and the earth. Have you guys seen sometimes the moon shines, sometimes the moon doesn't shine? Sometimes the moon is on its brightest, sometimes the moon is not on its brightest. Sometimes the moon is there and you don't see anything. Okay? The earth at night time is dependent on the moon for light. But the moon's job is to see the sun. If the moon, the moon can try and shine this light, the moon can't, can't shine light. The moon reflects light. And this is, this is a great mystery, and this is, this is what God is trying to show us through creation. As long as the sun and the, and the moon have a good relationship, the earth has light. When the moon and the sun don't have a good relationship, the earth doesn't have light. And in order for us to be light, we need the right relationship with the Son of God. We need to be seeing Christ. You can try to shine light without God, you can't do it. Without an active relationship with Christ, with, without Him doing it for you, it's pointless you do it. I'm serious. And, and um, uh, Paul didn't say, I, I strive to... Um, Philippians, he does say that I'll be likened unto his death and his resurrection, speaking about a manifestation in his flesh and his body and everything. But, but he goes on to say in Galatians chapter 2, is it somewhere? Galatians 2, probably verse 21, it says, It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ that's living on the inside of me. It says, The life that I now live, I do not live by the flesh, but I live by the faith of the Son of God. And he, he actually puts a whole different twist on the life of a Christian. That a Christian's life is not, is not trying to be like Christ. That is not your challenge. Your challenge is not to be like Christ. Your challenge is to let Christ live through you. That's your challenge. Is to allow God to express Himself through you. This is not about you trying to be like Christ. It's allow God to just, while you're loving God, it's happening. While you're looking at God, things are happening. While you're engaging in a relationship with Christ, people are, are being healed. People around you are experiencing Christ. People around you are seeing the true light of God. That's your job. Guys, take the pressure off of yourselves. It's not your job to be like Jesus to your families. It's your job just to give them Jesus. It's your job to show them Jesus. Not you. You can't do it in your own strength. Try and come, come, come speak to me when you fail. But when Christ, when you engage in your relationship with Christ, um, something happens. Your kids see something else. I, uh, Rudolph and I were having a conversation, but like I've mentioned the story what my dad did. Just my dad constantly at times going into a place to go pray. Just him going in to go pray. I knew he was going to go pray and I saw him come out. He didn't always give me the lessons he learned, but I, I always knew that he had his time with Jesus. He had his time with God. It's so, so important. Amen? Okay. All right. Thank you, my Father. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so reputation. You can't do anything about your reputation. You know that. How people see you is not, <laughs> is not up to you. How people see you. Not your job. Reputation is not your job. Character is your job. And what people think and what people say, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. And I read this quote the other day that really blessed me. They say, the most important prison that you can set yourself free from is the prison in which you care what others think about you the whole time, in which you're trapped in about you. I want to inspire you to, like Paul, what he said, Lord, let me, let me live a life that is pleasing to you. God, David prayed, he said, Lord, let the, let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, God. Let it be acceptable. And this is not law. 
This is grace. You know, sometimes we don't understand grace. Jesus comes and he teaches. The law says, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't commit adultery. Jesus says, hey, if you've thought it in your head, you've already committed adultery. The law says, don't, don't, uh, <laughs> don't murder. Jesus says, if you call someone stupid. <laughs> you know, sometimes I don't think we realize grace is just more intense. Like, but it, it's like it's, it's not law. It's just bringing you to maturity of where Christ lives through you. And, um, yeah, amen. So, we, we, we're going to do what Hebrews says. I think Hebrews chapter 6. Let's move on. Let's move on from here. Let's, uh, when Jesus died, He left your name on the wall. He left an inheritance for you. He left your name there. And, he said, and I want to live my life with that inheritance. Not as one that doesn't know about the inheritance. Not as one that is ignorant of all that God has planned and prepared for you. So Romans chapter 8. Let's go there. Verse 29, it says, For He knew all about us before we were born. Wow, that's quite a thought. He knew you before you were born. He destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of His Son. This means the Son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like Him. That's the Passion Translation. Jesus became the firstborn amongst many brothers, amongst many sisters. And so I'm challenged and I'm, I'm kind of inspired to just to embrace my union with Jesus, my acceptance into the family, to the beloved, that's what he calls it, into the family of God, and, and to realize that I don't need to settle for a a life that is less than the standard height of Christ's perfection, according to Ephesians. There's more. There is more. There is more that you can have in your relationship with Jesus. There is more to get. There is more to hear. There is so much that He wants to show you. There is so much that He's inviting you to. Um, the Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, always stands out to me. Jesus talks to the church. And he says, come up higher and I will show you things. You know, us church, we always want, want to lift Jesus higher. <laughs> higher, higher. Jesus, we lift you higher. Jesus is singing to the church, higher, higher. Come higher, come higher. Think higher. Engage more. Let's press in and get more. Let's, you know, trust God more. I challenge you. Do something. Put something on your faith. Maybe that you, that you change some stuff. Like if you've been, for example, if you got up at 5 a.m. in the morning to go pray, I challenge you, get up at quarter to five. <laughs> just, just put a little bit more faith and expectancy on what, you, on what you're doing now. You know, If you've grown accustomed to, to giving an amount, put some more faith on it. Say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you and go for more. Do it. And when you read your word, open it like, like, I remember I was at school and this one principal, he once took a Bible and he, he opened it up and he went, wow. <laughs> and I looked at him and I thought, crazy. But imagine the expectancy of just God is about to speak. Challenge you, every time you open up your Bible, have your pen ready. God is about to speak to you. And, and allow, embrace what Romans 12 verse 2 says. The renewal of your mind. He says, don't be conformed to this world. 
Don't let your life be formed by the opinions of people. Don't let your character be formed and, and shaped by superstars, by <laughs> idols, by your peer groups. Come out of that and, and let's, let's live a life, one in which we, we seek to please God, and one which we, we choose to, to take His hand and to fulfill the plans that He prepared for us. Amen. My favorite song from Jesus Culture, Come Away. It's going to be wild. It's going to be great. It's going to be full of Him. May your faith and your relationship with God be better than what it's ever been. May, may you struggle to go to sleep at night from excitement. Say amen. amen. May you be so joyful when you wake up from the dreams that He's given you. May, man, may you shake, may you yearn inside for more of God. And, uh, and, and, and let's go for that. Enjoy, enjoy your relationship with Jesus. Something really good is happening all over the world today. You know, people are, people are, are you can see it happening. People are starting to do things. You know, look, Vadner, he was, um, he had like a worship night in his house and things like that. It's awesome. Things are happening. Um, your home, you know, your family. If you're a dad, you're a mom. You're, you're a pastor. <laughs> if you're a mom or a dad, you're, you're a pastor. <laughs> You've got people around you, people that you need to speak life into. Here from the throne room, take it, take it to your children and bless them. All right, I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you that today each person can hear the invitation to a higher life with you a higher life, an adventure, a journey with Jesus, with you. And I, I thank you for your reality, Father. Lord, if you had not in some way made yourself visible to us, we would not be here. So thank you for, for leading us, bringing us to a place like this where we can hear your voice, where we can hear your spirit, we can, we can hear the unction of the spirit, the calling. I pray for the, for the people here that they'll be so, the world will, will just latch on to them, want, want to have what they have, that they'll be so full of the peace of God, that they'll be so bubbling over with the joy that comes from the Spirit, that, that people will, will look to the light, you know, they will want the water that, that you've caused us to drink from. I pray for, for visions, I pray for your voice. I pray for signs that you'll speak to each one in their own unique way as they mature and grow in a, in a relationship with Christ. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.